Hi, I'm Sam Albury. I'm a pastor and one of the speakers um, here with Ocker, and I'm joined by Rebecca McLaughlin. Rebecca, it's great to have you with us. Hello, it's great to be here. Um, we're going to be thinking about how we use the Bible in apologetics, how we use the Bible in, in trying to commend the faith to other people. And as we are making this video now, you are actually here in Oxford doing that very thing. You're speaking at a series of events to try to help students at the university here think about the claims of, of Jesus Christ. And I thought it'd be good to ask you how you're approaching that, um, what kind of topics you're using, what scriptures you're bringing to bear on those topics and, and what's kind of informed those choices. So what are some of the topics you've been speaking on this week? Yeah, it's been a series of five talks. So the first one was, aren't we better off with, without religion? I think a big question in people's minds, whether it's sort of morally or just sociologically, <clears throat> is the world becoming less religious? Does that matter? Is that a good thing yeah. or a bad thing? Uh, looked at, has science disproved Christianity? Um, is Christianity uh, opposed to diversity, which I think is a, a massive moral question for people, people today, and um, trying to look there at both questions of, of race and love across mm. racial difference on the one hand, and also questions of sexuality and she sexual identity on the other. Mm. Um, it's been looking at, wasn't Christianity a hindrance to justice and equality? Mm. And the last one is going to be, how can a loving God allow all the suffering that we see in the world today. How do you pick those particular topics? Are you just thinking, what are the five biggest questions you hear people asking? How do you come up with them? Yeah, I think it can be tempting if you, like me, are a follower of Jesus to want to steer away from the kinds of questions that probably make many of us who are Christians sort of feel really uncomfortable mm. and like we're, we're a little bit on the back foot morally. Yeah. And actually, I, I, what I try to do is, is to step into those spaces more and to say, in actual fact, the things that my friends who maybe are not followers of Jesus, but who, for example, care deeply about justice and equality, mm. care deeply about diversity, recognise that our, our sexuality is really precious and important to us and that there are real moral questions at stake those those kinds of kinds of areas are ones where I would want to step into that mm. from a Christian perspective and say, actually, I think our, our d the deepest longings of our heart, both personally and ethically, are most satisfied in Jesus. Mm. And if I believe that, which I do, then as I look more closely at each of these questions that seem like a kind of roadblock to faith in Jesus, they become a signpost. Yeah. Um, but I never want to do that it, uh, apart from what the scriptures say. I think there are, there are ways that we can sometimes be tempted if, if we're followers of Jesus to sort of engage with those questions that actually steer us further and further away from the Bible. Yeah. And I think that's a temptation, whether we're talking about science or, on the one hand or sort of sexuality on the other. Actually, I think we need to stay very close to what the scriptures tell us, because ultimately, um, if Jesus is, is who he says he is, then his word is authoritative and is going to give us the, the only hope that we have in yeah. the face of any of these questions. So I want to keep very close to the scriptures. So we'll come to that in just a moment. Um, you're talking about, you know, what you might think would be the roadblock becomes a signpost. I mean, are you, are you sort of listening to, to friends? Is that where you're thinking, oh gosh, people are really asking about this? Or are you, how are you kind of gauging which of those questions are the sort of the ones that people out there might be asking or wanting to hear about? Yeah, it's a whole combination of things. Everything from my conversations with friends who would not identify as Christians to the kinds of conversations my kids are having in school or mm. with, with their friends to also reading. I, I try to read some of the, the books that are coming out from leading sort of secular um, thinkers, philosophers, historians, mm. thought, sort of thought leaders in general yeah. and see um, what kinds of arguments they're making and, and how that connects up with um, what I'm experiencing yeah. in, in my kind of immediate community and hearing from others. That's really helpful because I think sometimes people, would, you know, how do we even know what people are asking? That, that mm. it's good to make sure we're we're trying to track with some of the bigger questions and conversations going on around us. You you speak about a whole range of questions and and teach the Bible in a way that connects with, with culture on a, on a number of issues. But I know you're often asked to speak on questions of sexuality. So that's, you know, as mm. with me, that's part of, of your story of um, experiencing same sex attraction and understanding the scriptures um, in like the application of scripture being very live in, mm. in your own life in that area, as it should be you know, for anyone who's following Jesus. How do you navigate 
when you're talking either in public contexts or even in private conversations uh, between your own personal story oh. and bringing relevant scriptural texts to bear on questions of, of sexual ethics. How do you think about that? Yeah, I, I try to do a bit of both. Mm. The, the story helps because it gives you, um, well, A, it's, you, you are an authority when it comes to your own story. Um, so I, I'd like to mention that it, it can build a bit of a bridge for those who are identifying as LGBTQ and, and so on. Um, it can be a point of some common contact. But you're, you're quite right that we need to go beyond story. Everyone has a story. Um, but actually what we're trying to share ultimately is the message of Jesus. And that's that's the goal for me as a Christian. If, if people get to know me better, understand my, my journey better, that's great. I love that. It's, it's a nice way to, to sort of feel more known and I love hearing other people's stories too. But also but what I most want for people is for them to come to know Jesus. Mm. Um, and so I want my story to be a way of giving one worked example of what it looks like to find life in Jesus in the context of a, of a narrative that you people might think actually would be a reason to, to avoid him. Mm, mm. So, and Jesus has things to say on these things. So um, it's, it's common for people to think that Jesus never really talked about issues of sexuality, but he does at various points and he has things that, that actually all of us need to hear. Mm. Um, and areas where he's, he's shown himself to be so good to us. So I like to anchor what I'm saying, not just in scripture, but specifically in the, in the gospels. And I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on this too. Uh, whatever topic I'm speaking on, if I can speak to it from one of the gospels, I prefer to. Mm -hmm. I believe all of the Bible is inspired and authoritative. So it's not that I think, you know, the rest of the Bible is, is less God's word than the gospels. But I really want people to see Jesus himself in action. Um, when it comes to sexuality, I want people to realize that I I have the beliefs that I have because I'm a follower of this Jesus. Yeah. But I'm always wanting people to, really, I want people to end up reading a gospel. Yeah. Because I think that's the best way to engage with his teaching. Is that, what's your thinking on that? Yeah, I, I very much agree. To me, the Gospels are sort of like the front door to the house that is all of the scriptures. Mm. Because at the end of the day, if Jesus isn't who he says he is, mm. then what the Old Testament has to say, what the rest of the New Testament has to say is of very little relevance. You know, yeah. maybe of vague cultural interest, mm. but it doesn't have any real authority over you and me here now. But if Jesus really is the Son of God, who came to die on a cross for our sins and to be raised to life so that we could have new life with him, yeah. That makes a claim on us in a in a, a way that then shaped how we think about all of the rest of the scriptures. And especially when it comes to sexual ethics, although I think this is probably true of all the other kind of angles on, yeah. on apologetics that, that both of us try to address. I like to tell the story of the, the whole Bible in a way that centers Jesus, because I think the story mm. of the whole Bible does, but that starts the story in the Old Testament. You know, when we hear, for instance, about God as a faithful loving husband and Israel as his mm. often unfaithful wife and how this marriage seems to be in crisis by the time you get to the Gospels. Mm. Jesus then steps under the stage of human history and says he's the bridegroom. Yeah. And you think, well, what on earth is that about? And why is a, a man who was single all his life mm. calling himself the bridegroom? You realise it's, it's one of the ways he's stepping into the shoes of the creator God of the Old Testament. And then we see as, as the story of the Bible progresses, we see that Christian marriage is a little scale model of Jesus' love for his church. Mm. And we see in the last book of the Bible, a sort of strange and wonderful book of Revelation, uh, this great shout going up, the wedding of the Lamb has come and Jesus is married to his church, bringing heaven and earth back together. Mm. So when I'm talking about Christian sexual ethics, I actually want to locate it in that big picture story of the Bible mm. with Jesus at the very center of it. Mm. And to say, you know, Christian sexual ethics is actually much weirder than most people yeah. think. It's not just that we're saying actually sex only belongs in marriage between a man and a woman, but we're saying it, it's really all about this metaphor of Jesus' love for his people. That's what, what everything's pointing to. So, so I suppose I try to sort of scoop up the, the yeah. scriptures in, in, um, and, and pull out the different themes that we see playing through them and how they relate to then the questions that are on people's hearts and minds today. Which is why I love that approach and, and try and do something like that myself. And, and it's, it's why I think Sexuality is, is one particular topic and theme. Doesn't 
I don't feel like that's conversations around that are taking me away from Jesus. I find no. that it's such a natural way to talk about Jesus. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's good to remember as well that as well as using specific biblical texts to use the whole narrative of the Bible itself, mm. use the Bible in its totality as a text, can, can be very powerful. Mm. Now, t tomorrow you're speaking on the subject of suffering. Yeah. And you're not doing a whole Genesis to Revelation overview there, I don't think. So what's your, your, what are you doing Bible-wise with that topic tomorrow? One of my absolute favourite chapters in all the Bible, and I know it's a bit weird. I know, you know, just like you shouldn't say you have favourite children. Um, <laughs> I have three children, love them all equally. Uh, but the reality is that all of us are probably deeply drawn to different texts of the Bible in, in, a, in a very particular way. Yeah. And, and what those texts are may even change through the course of our life as we, as we need in a very visceral way. We need to hear God's word <clears throat> that's, that's given to us in a particular text or passage. For me, there's a particular chapter in John's Gospel, in John chapter 11, where if you were going to give the kind of headline news of that chapter, one sentence summary, mm -hmm. you could say it's Jesus raises a man called Lazarus from the dead. But actually, if you look at the whole of that chapter and the, the story, the progression of that narrative, you find that there's so much more going on, even than the extraordinary miracle of Jesus raising this guy from the dead. Mm. And... I believe that John 11 has a, a whole kind of biblical theology of suffering packed into this, this one story because it begins with two friends of Jesus, Mary and Martha of Bethany, sending Jesus a message and saying, Lord, the one you love is sick. Hmm. Their brother Lazarus, they, they don't call him Lazarus, they, they say the one you love. Hmm. So already tuned into the fact, Jesus really loved this man. And then John tells us again, now, Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and so he didn't come. And you think, well, how can that, how does yeah. that make any sense? It would make sense if it said Jesus loved Mary, Martha and Lazarus, and so he came at once, dropped everything, ran. Yeah. Or it would make sense if it said Jesus didn't really care about Mary, Martha and Lazarus, and so he had other things to do and he thought he'll come another time. But no, John is very clear. Jesus loved Mary, Martha and Lazarus, and he didn't go. In fact, he deliberately waits until Lazarus is dead. Yeah. And then he goes to, to Bethany, where this family lives. And Martha comes out to him and she says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, whatever you ask of God, he will give you. It was extraordinary faith that this woman has. You know, yeah. her, her brother has died. You can feel her, her sort of disappointment that Jesus didn't come, but she's still hopeful he can do something. And Jesus gives her this theological answer. He says, your brother will rise again. And for Jews of Jesus' day, many of them believe there would be a resurrection of God's righteous people at the end of time. But you can almost hear the disappointment in her voice. You know, what yeah. about now, Jesus? What about now? She yeah. didn't send him that message because she hoped that her brother would rise at the end of time. She wants her brother back now. And then Jesus looks into the eyes of this grieving woman and says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, even though he dies, will live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? You know, we see in that moment that, that Jesus, who has deliberately allowed this woman to suffer the pain of her brother dying, mm. meets her and says, actually, what you most need is not what I can do for your brother. What you most need is me. Like, I am the resurrection and the life. Do you mm. believe this? He, he calls for a, a personal response from her in the midst of her crisis. And she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, of God who is coming into the world. Mary, her sister, comes out, says the same thing to Jesus. Uh, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus goes with them to Lazarus's tomb. And then we have this incredibly confusing verse where John tells us that Jesus wept. Mm. You know, he, stand, he, he deliberately let Lazarus die and yet he goes with these sisters and, and weeps with them. And the people who are, who are watching what's unfolding, like some of them say, look how much he loved Lazarus. And other people say, wait a minute. You know, couldn't this man who opened the eyes of the blind man also have stopped Lazarus from dying? And the answer is yes. Mm. And if, as a follower of Jesus, I need to believe that the God of all the universe can actually step in and could actually prevent the suffering that I might be going through, that you might be going through, that we might be witnessing around us. 
And yet at the same time in this na narrative, we see Jesus communicating that relationship with him is more important even than the suffering we're going through and that he will weep with us as we suffer. Hmm. I think there's a profound way in which we experience Jesus in the midst of suffering. And the Bible calls Jesus a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Hmm. We see him as the, the, the suffering servant sent by God expressly to die in our place. Hmm. And I think when, when Jesus died on the cross, it's profoundly important that we recognize that he was dying to take the punishment for our sin. And at the same time, he, he is dying to enter into our suffering mm. and the, the human experience of suffering and death, that he, he takes all our sin and our sorrow onto himself in that moment. And I think we, we kind of glimpse that in this narrative. And then the last sort of move of the story is Jesus saying, roll the stone away from Lazarus's tomb. And then he shouts out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come mm. out. And John says, the man who is dead came out. Hmm. To, to me, a, a thoroughly Christian understanding of suffering is, is laid out for us in that chapter hmm. in a way, not that it answers all our questions, because we're, we're always going to have questions about our, our particular experience of suffering, the, the tragic suffering that we see around us in the world. Where is God in the midst of that? But I think in that chapter, we see Jesus entering into suffering and being the one who can ultimately raise the dead, hmm. which is the kind of fix that we need. So there's a long answer to your no, it's question. That's, that's wonderful. I had a, a preview of, of that whole talk, which is great. <laughs> um, so there's a, there's a few things running through my mind then. So you, part of the reason you picked that is because it, it's, it's a passage you naturally feel drawn to, but you're also thinking, okay, the, of the main things I would want to say, I can say, a significant number of those things from this particular text. Yeah. Now, some of us, when we're, when we're doing this, we might be doing a talk from the Bible on some question like this, and we're doing it in a church on a Sunday morning, and there's pews and Bibles in the pews and that kind of stuff. You're, you're doing it at a, in a, a kind of public place, not a, not a church. People won't have pew Bibles. Are you going to have people beam up a passage on their phone? How, how do you cope with covering a fair bit of biblical terrain in a context where people don't have a scripture in front of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm a, a huge fan of reading the Bible. And one of the lovely things about this week is actually there are copies of John's Gospel on the tables for people to take away from them. And I'm trying to encourage people to do mm. that. But the reality is for, for most of Christian history and, and for a lot of the, the church across the world today, people's access to the scriptures has been through their ears rather than through yeah. their eyes. So you'll kind of read as you... So I think actually there are times when if we are narrating scripture to people, hmm. I'm not saying that I would want to, to stop that. I mean, I would always want somebody to open a Bible for themselves, assuming yeah. that they are literate, which, you know, as far as I know, people at Oxford, Oxford students are mostly literate in my experience. And so I would want them to, to take John's gospel away and read it for themselves. And I've yeah. been personally encouraging people to do that through this week. But I think it's okay... To, to talk them in this kind of context, where, as you say, we're mm. not in a church where people are expecting to open up a Bible. Mm. I think it's okay to talk them through a passage and to, to quote specific sections of it and to sort of summarize mm. pieces in between so that you know, we're helping people to kind of continue through, through the narrative. Yeah, does that's that great. Make sense? That really does, because we, we want people to be engaging with scripture itself. Yeah. Um, but we also recognize that the scripture needs explaining. I think of the um, Ethiopian eunuch in, in Acts mm. 8 who's, who's got some scripture in front of him somehow, but Philip turns up and says, what are you reading? And, and the guy says, yeah, but how am I, how am I going to understand this mm. if someone doesn't explain it to me? Um, so, you know, that, that's why you're giving a talk and not just literally reading out scripture tomorrow. You want to explain it, unpack it, try and show how it engages with where people are at and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, there's as well as I do, if not better, the Bible is incredibly exciting. Yeah. <laughs> and I think sometimes even when, you know, if, if you like me or somebody who goes to church on a regular basis, sometimes people read the Bible out as if it was boring. Mm. <laughs> you know, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. You know, the beginning of John's Gospel as if it's reading a kind of laundry list. 
No, I think the Bible is incredibly exciting. Hmm. And, and I think even how we read the Bible, whether we're reading it out loud or whether it's something that's kind of lodged in our minds that we're hmm. declaiming, as it were, we need to, to communicate it with the kind of energy that says, I actually think this is the powerful word of God. Hmm. And the, the relevance of the Bible to our questions, concerns, and the, the desires of our hearts today is so profound that it will leap off the page hmm. if if we if we expect it to i think yeah. actually yeah i love that and I, I similarly i love encouraging people to take a gospel away i love having gospels available for people to take away and i'm, I'm always quietly confident that if someone does read a gospel they will find it very hard just to keep it at arm's length as mm. they read it because mm. there's something so unique about the, the Bible and we see this so clearly in the Gospels that as we read the Gospel we find that it's it's reading us mm. and there's, there's, a, there's something happening as we read it. We can't just read it as a historic religious text or yeah. something. It's living and active as, as it says about itself. Mm. Well thank you for those thoughts. It's great to chat with you. Thanks Sam. Hey guys, how are you doing? My name is Nathaniel and I'm part of the Ocker team. And I just wanted to say a big thank you for watching this film we made. At Oka, we really love to speak about the big questions of our time and to show how the Christian faith provides credible and valuable answers. If you've enjoyed this film, check out the other stuff on our channel and also please consider subscribing and following us. It really helps to make more films like this. We also want to hear from you. So if you have any ideas for new content, please put them in the comments below or get in touch with us directly. Thanks goes out to all the speakers, donors, and film team of which I'm a part of and actually fun fact it takes around 60 hours to make all of these films and that's because we want to make sure the content is incredibly well researched it looks and it flows beautifully and ultimately that it's actually useful to you so this means a lot of research listening to our audience and filmmaking our incredible staff at Oka who make these films are funded by donations so if you want to partner with us with our work please also consider donating which is really easy on our website see you next time